Well, welcome to the first Manahan Google Hangout. We're here to discuss some of the issues arising from today's show. I'm going to be discussing uh, the issues with the Daily Telegraph's senior political correspondent, Christopher Hope, and the columnist and blogger, Sonny Handel. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining me. Uh, let's uh, dive in straight away and talk about this issue of the, the missing Home Office dossier. This was the one... Uh, given to the then Home Secretary Leon Britton back in the early 1980s by the late MP Geoffrey Dickens. Uh, Christopher, do you see this as being something which deserves, as some are calling for, an overarching independent inquiry? I think, I think we're getting there, Dermot. I think, um, as your interview with Keith Vaz showed, I think we're getting towards a situation when, where it's becoming a, a bit, of, a bit as, as disparate as the, as the um, phone hacking scandal, and we're going towards requiring possibly an overarching inquiry um, in the future. Not just yet. I mean, we're initially focusing on these Dickens uh, dossier that, that was lost, and that's what Mark said will will be in front of the Home Affairs Select Committee on Tuesday to say who is the legal advisor who will be carrying out that inquiry. But we're we're waiting to see. I think um, and Keith has used that analogy. It's quite a helpful one because I think we are going towards some form of need for some kind of nap. Um, overarching closure, which um, arguably you may get that from an inquiry, although as we've seen, Leveson didn't really close off that debate on hacking, did it? No. Sally, what's your take on all this? I mean, David Mellor was also on the programme, and he was a Home Office Minister at the time, and uh, he said there was a whiff of a witch hunt about it all. Yeah, I, I thought that was a bit complacent. I think that there are serious questions to be asked here, and I think that Christopher's right that we are heading towards a broader national inquiry. And I think that Susie Boniface on your program made a, a good, you know, argument for it and said that, you know, all these things need to be investigated and we need to have a proper look into what was going on and why some mistakes were made. And I think it's incredibly complacent of former uh, MPs uh, like David Mellor on your program saying that, you know, this sounds like a witch hunt and we shouldn't get too caught up in it because those words will come back and bite them later on, I suspect. Well, let's stay, I mean, both of you, let's stay with the Leveson parallels because, as we've just seen with uh, those, that inquiry and then the criminal investigations, the, the, the inquiry came before some of the criminal investigations and some of the trials, of course, one of which has just concluded. There are some more to come. Given the nature of the allegations involved here, wouldn't it be best to let the law take its course first of all? Christopher. Well, I agree that there is a problem that um, I think it was raised by uh, uh, so this morning, that if you do have uh, an overarching inquiry, then it gets delay. It delays actual um, action on some of the Pacifics, um, as we're seeing in in Leveson. I mean, all sorts of things which are going to happen now. Um, now this old Bailey inquiry is concluded. I think the problem is you have too many overarching, overlaying uh, situations. But the problem is, as Keith has said, is you've got these individual eruptions of problems all over the place, and it'd be nice to pull that into one space, but. Um, that will further delay and probably not, not give the closure that everyone wants from this situation. I mean, it's a problem. I, I thought David Mellor's point, I know what Sonny means there, um, but also Mellor's point was probably valid that um, you know, he lived for 12 years after, didn't he, after presenting that, that dossi dossier, Jeffrey Dickens, and, and he wasn't going on about it um, after, for what didn't seem to be publicly talking about it. So um, it's interesting that, you know, that he didn't, and, um, and that's you know. a point worth making. Yeah, that's Jeffrey Dickens, of course, so referring to the late uh, Jeffrey Dickens. So, I mean, what do you think about that? You know, nobody, it seems, you can find nobody that seems to have seen and absorbed that dossier. It's almost been treated as if it was tablets of stone. But wasn't that, in a way, that uh, could have been the 1980s version of what happened last year when a television presenter did some Googling about uh, a variety of allegations and presented them to the Prime Minister as a, as a set of facts? You've got to be very careful, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, that was a bit of a disaster, and I, and I do d uh, agree that that would be a bad situation to be in. But I, I think, look, the point about a public inquiry isn't just to look at the criminal sort of side of things, which are c clearly important, but it's also to look at why exactly weren't these issues taken more seriously, were there broader failings uh, within the Home Office, perhaps, within the, within the police service, you know, within, ju within the judicial system. And those questions will not come up entirely in a in a criminal inquiry. And I so I so think that you know whether you have it before or after, it's got to happen. And I think that it's incre it's incredibly 
dangerous and damaging and also to victims who potentially might want to come forward to say, you know, this looks like a witch hunt. And, you know, as we saw in the Savile Inquiry uh, in, the, in the case, that actually there have been loads of victims in the past who have yeah. uh, been afraid to come forward because of worries that, you know, there's a witch hunt or this is all being exaggerated, etc. So I think the word should be cho chosen carefully, and I don't think that David Miller was on the right side of choosing his words. Yeah. Okay, well, that, uh, that debate, I'm sure, will continue. We want to move on here, though, now, because uh, another area where words have to be choos chosen very carefully. Indeed, I talked to the former defence... teams are fighting and have fought with ISIS in Syria and Iraq. Now, I put it to him, and this question was very carefully phrased. I said, given that tomorrow is that yeah. awfully sad anniversary of 7-7 uh, in London, uh, the 7th of July attacks back in 2005, I said, was it inevitable that something like that, given the numbers involved here who fought there, was it inevitable something like that would happen again? He was very careful, this is what I'm talking about, choosing the words carefully, he was very careful to say it's not inevitable something like that will happen again, but it's inevitable that someone will try. That's pretty chilling, isn't it? Um, is that for me or for Chris? Yes, Sonny, you kick off. Yeah, I mean, I think to a large extent is it is inevitable. There are lots of jihadi groups, and jihadi groups have been trying for, for decades to set up a caliphate in the Middle East. So I don't think that is entirely, uh, that was inevitable to a large extent. The problem is, though, that the Iraq war created a vacuum of power there, and, and Maliki's actions themselves in sort of being much, uh, sort of uh, maligning some of the Sunni uh, sort of parts of the government in Iraq created more of, a, more of a vacuum where ISIS came in and exploited that. So there are loads of factors here, and I, I wouldn't blame the Iraq war entirely. The problem for us is, you know, what do we do? And I thought it was interesting that Liam Fox said essentially that intervention in Syria was not going to happen, you know, not now, and he was, he, he was against in thinking that, you know, it was going to make a bad situation worse. So to a large extent, we are spectators in all this. We can't do much about Syria. We can't do much about Iraq, really, now that we've pulled out. Um, and I don't really think that this is a conflict that we can really play much of a part in. And that's the scary thing, because we see that it'll have blowback, possibly, over here. But I'm not sure what we can do. Well, that is it. That is Well, let's deal with the blowback on on what something can be done about that, presumably, in this country. And Christopher, you know, the, the, the question is, and the point to be made is this, is it not, that there is a, a small but significant number of young, mainly Muslim men in this country who go to, to fight overseas, to train and fight overseas and learn expertise in some terrorist techniques because they believe that somehow this nation oppresses Muslims and must be punished for it. How is that view counted? Well, it's a big worry, isn't it? I mean, um, David Cameron recently said that the threat now from Syria um, and from Iraq in that area is now the biggest threat to this country's security, outweighing um, the threat from Afghanistan and Pakistan. So um, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, I think um, there were renewed attempts to, to engage locally. I mean, the problem is that we go into this whole contest terror strategy um, uh, and whether and how far do you engage with these groups without sort of almost apologising what they're doing when you're trying to talk to them to understand what they're saying? I think Malcolm Rifkind in today's Telegraph um, tried to bring it home to readers when he said that the reason he has seen um, he's aware of the risk of this country and he's justifying these large queues at airports caused by the extra terror concerns. He says these are absolutely necessary and we have to believe and trust what Malcolm, Malcolm Rifkind says. Don't forget he's the chairman of a parliamentary body which oversees the security services so he really is there he is what he sees we have to uh, accept is a big risk to this country and, and, and um, it's very hard for, for um, when you in, in the wake of, of, of Trojan horse gate and we're hearing more this week from Peter Clark um, to, to under when when Birmingham schools were uh, infiltrated by um, 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 Islamist uh, groups. I mean, the, the the problem there you have is, you know, at what point do you sort of impose uh, kind of what you might call a British culture on these people and try and make them sort of re recognise they can't be extremists? It's difficult. Okay, worrying stuff. We're running out of time, so we'll move on. Uh, a recurring theme, one we've been discussing for several weeks, months, and indeed years for now. It's Ed Miliband's 
leadership of the Labour Party. And as I say, a recurring theme last week, uh, one of his uh, key policy makers was saying how difficult it was to get any traction for his ideas within, uh, in particular, Ed Miliband's office. Sonny Hungle, do you think um, that Ed Miliband is in any trouble from within his own party? They don't traditionally get rid of their leaders easily, do they? Chairman, I think this uh, horse has been flogged enough repeatedly. Yeah. I mean, look, I, you know, this is not, uh, he's not facing even vaguely a challenge within his party. He's in a strong position because he has uh, kept the party together, which was, is quite a historic achievement in itself. He has uh, laid a path out forward for the party intellectually, uh, organizationally, uh, you know, uh, and even trying to come back to power with being within being in competition to be in power five years or four years after being defeated so badly is a massive achievement in itself. So I don't think anyone within the party is going to call for Miliband to uh, leave anytime soon. So to a large extent, I think this is a Westminster bubble sort of um, a, 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 a thing, you know, uh, we, we, lo we love to discuss these sort of plots. But I don't think it's going to happen. I think Miliband's going to carry on as before, as questions have been raised before in taking the party forward. Uh, okay, and I'm sure, Christopher, you go along with that, that Ed Miliband's going to carry on. But what's he going to carry on to? Do you think he's going to carry on to become Prime Minister? I, I think I think Sonny's right that he will he will carry on. I mean, we're gonna, we are going to see a Miliband-Cameron uh, election uh, in May next year. I think it's I think Sonny's wrong to say it's a Westminster bubble issue. It's far more than that. If you talk to anybody outside the bubble, there are issues with how... Uh, Ed Miliband presents on television. I think if uh, the Labour lead in the polls is despite his leadership, really. Um, he's got some good ideas, but how he presents them is, is questionable, I think, um, and how he needs to deal with that. And and, uh, and he's obviously getting advice, which is not always the best, from some of his advisors. I think he needs uh, to deal with all sorts of... I mean, the problem he's got is Ed, Ed, Ed Balls uh, accepting, uh, possibly, uh, that they overlooked... Um, or, um, Areas of what went wrong with the economy and, and saying it wasn't entirely private sector. Some would say that needs to be dealt with. I think um, we are now going to see an Ed Miliband, David Cameron um, face off. That that won't change. And I think this, um, but I think it does matter to the wider public. Okay, and is there a fundamental question, Sonny Handel, for Ed Miliband and for the public to get a grip onto what he actually represents? And it's this: Where will he fight the general election from in terms of the political territory? Will he be more? more from the left, people think that that's how he got elected, or will he take them back more towards the old Blairite years? I, I don't think that that's how the public is going to try and figure out where he stands. I think the question for them will be, is the Labour Party, given the fact that even over the last four years, most people don't feel that their lot has improved, you know, is the Labour Party going to improve their living standards, their way of life over the, you know, over the next five years if they come into power? That's the question they're going to be asking, not whether he's coming from the left or from the bearer. You know, yeah. they a lot of the public, for example, is for national nationalisation of railways, which you would say is from the left. So the point is, they're going to want to know, you know, is he is he does he have the answers or not? And I think that Miliband over the next year, ten months, is going to say, this is how I would improve your life. And this is how the Labour Party is going to do things differently to the Tories. And that's where I think the key questions are going to be. Yeah, so Christopher, is that Westminster bubbly then? Uh, people like you and me want a fully thought out programme. We want to know ideologically which side of the, of the political divide you come from. When in actual fact, what Sonny seems to be saying, he just needs one or two more good ideas like the energy price freeze. And he could be in. Well, I think Ed Miliband is really clever at strategy. I mean, if you look at the way he's behaved the past four years, he's taken this consumer view, this small guy view against big everything, big media, big bag banks, big energy companies. Very effective. What does the government do? It either um, agrees with Miliband and says, yes, the problem, or it says, no, no, it's not a problem, and backs the monopoly. It's very, very hard. It's very clever politics. Um, I think it's going to be a kind of... Re I mean, it's clever work, really, but I, th I just do think he lacks um, the kind of je ne sais quoi, the kind of prime minister material, this blink test. Shut your eyes and imagine him as prime minister. I'm not sure it passes that one, Sonny. <laughs> OK, Christopher, <laughs> Sonny Handel. Uh, well, I'm afraid we must end it there. It's great to have some more time to talk to you guys. Thank you both very much indeed. Thanks, so much. Thanks Christopher. Thanks. And, yeah, <laughs> Thanks so well, good to see you, as I say. And uh, that's the end of our first Murnahan Google Hangout. Uh, thank you very much indeed for watching and I hope participating. Do join us next time. Goodbye. <laughs>